slides sort of together. Sure. And, uh, and Eric can kind of explain a little bit of background on how he sets these up and, and what he uses. So I think I can do it so I can present to everyone. Because when you're talking, you're going to be big on the screen. I think it'll still, I don't know, can you guys see that pretty well? Is that okay? Yeah. That okay. okay. All right. So um, Casey and Randy, neither of you have done a tick yet, correct? On our own, yeah. I did it with you. On your own, right. So, um, you know, we have the basic triple impact competitor workshop that I'm sure you saw on Google Drive, mm -hmm. and it is just that. It's pretty basic. It requires a lot of your own questioning and your own personality to make it interactive. I think, Randy, you know, and Casey, I'm sure you know, if you're with a group of high school kids, um, you know, they die from PowerPoints. PowerPoints are the least exciting thing they could ever possibly see. So anything you can do, as Eric was saying too, like he keeps the kids standing for most of the workshop probably. The more I can keep them up, moving around, discussing, talking, high-fiving, whatever they need to do to make this real for them, the better, depending on the room size and the amount of kids that are going to be there. Um, this workshop that Eric put together is, you know, it's pieced from obviously the, the original TIC workshop, mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of questions in it already built in a lot of really thought-provoking yeah. things and articles that, that can get you already thinking. So um, what I wanted to do is have Eric just give you a little bit of background behind some of it, and then you guys can add in some of your ideas. Um, I can throw in some of the things that I do with some of these activities, and then, um, and then you'll be good to go. Um, were, the, were the videos able to play for you, Randy, when you opened it? I think, yeah, I think most of them did. Uh, there was, uh, which one I have a hard time with? Uh, <clears throat> I can say, uh-oh, Eric's voice is going out. Yeah. You know, Mike. Eric, we can send I, you I know the video. I the water as a book. Yeah. Right. There was one that I don't think I came across. OK. Yeah, there, whatever was on slide 28 was just a black. Yeah, yeah I, think the I think the thing to do is, is sort of, again, Cal, however you want to do this, one way to do this is just sort of walk through the slides, yep. and I can tell you why, why they exist, and you decide a sure. little bit of what you want to do. I mean, I, I love the basketball. That basketball video, Eric, was, was banging. Yeah, oh, you got that one on leadership, the, the, the Cal and Wes Madison? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What that a tear jerker that one is. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, yeah. long. Exactly. it's long. It's long, but it's a so, good one. I guess why don't we just die? All right. It is like, yeah, but you know what's so funny about that? Ruben's how big I, I get it, but you know, if it's good, it, I think we can give them a little bit more credit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they watch yeah. it. Absolutely. It's and it, it, mm -hmm. it's sometimes we're too frenetic. So I, I like it. Anyhow, I, I said before and I'll say it again. This is a suggestion. This is catered to my personality or lack thereof. And uh, <laughs> I say it all the time about being the magic in the room. I will tell you why these things are here. If you feel like there's something that you can do, do it. If it's something that you, if you're not comfortable with, don't do it. The neat thing about Kelly and me is I think we're each equally effective and completely different. Mm -hmm. So I'll just tell you, I'm sort of just going to walk through what I say, and please interrupt at any point. Okay. So in some fashion, again, establishing yourself at the beginning of the magic in the room and, and sort of the voice in which you're going to speak, you know, for me, Casey in particular, of – Establishing, you know, you are, I always say anybody here hope to play sports in college. And a lot of people say yes and say, well, okay, that's something we have in common. I play Division One sports. Same thing, again, Casey, you can mention that you did, you know, uh, little, little things like that. I mentioned that I am a high school coach presently, and I'm also a parent. So I can speak in a number of different voices. I understand you want to play in college. I know what that's about. I, I'm a present high school coach, so I know what I value with that. And I am a parent who's had kids play high school sports and I, I look at the final thing is I tell them I taught high school English and I warn them that we're going to have moments of high school English class. <laughs> so again, that allows me to be, that's me. That's not going to sound like you, but in some fashion, um, I mean, again, Case, you, you, know, you played Division One sports. You're a sports psychologist. You've, you're, you're there to help them. I think mm -hmm. just to really establish that at the beginning is huge. Mm -hmm. um, so then I say, you know, for me, it's let's find out what they know. I said, all right, I told you before, we're going to have moments of English class. This is one of them. The title of the workshop is Triple Impact Competitor. I said, how many elements in triple? Obviously, they all say three. three. Said, okay, you nailed what? Right. They laugh. Okay, I said, how about impact? There's usually 
it, they can't define impact initially, and then some clown always says, you know, to smash into. So, <laughs> like, okay, no, and then to have, you know, you know what the word means. I said, okay, you struggled with that. A little bit, we're doing better. How, about, how would you define the word competitor? And the point right away is you can pretty quickly determine, you know, where they are and then as a culture in the school on how they, you know, you, there was no debate on triple. We struggled a little with impact, and we were all over the map on competitor. We're going to use the remaining hour and 10 minutes or whatever to define it. So that way I've established what the workshop is. Mm -hmm. Because what we have found, just so you know, is, you know, Jim's big into these sticky messages. Nobody remembers triple impact competitor. Mm -mm. They're like, oh, the leadership workshop. Oh, the this. So right away we know what we're talking about. I said, okay. So I changed the slide. So the three elements we identified, the first thing is make yourself better, make the teammates better, and the game better. And I noticed for some reason on this slide, uh, the, the R in better, what happened is it got transferred from Keynote. It, it chopped it off. So you may yeah. want to slide that over. Slide yeah, so that make picture it, over. Yeah. I hadn't caught that before. All right, so those are the three things. Then, again, I'm big. This is where potentially, if you want to do the icebreaker, you could do an icebreaker if you feel like you need one. This, and, and, Cal, I, I, I'm sure you have your you know, ones you do. I do that when I get them up and partner with someone they don't know. Mm -hmm. And I do this. I either do it here or I do it. If you knew me, you'd know that icebreaker. Do you know that one? No, go ahead. Like two truths and a lie? Mm, similar, but I just say, you know, I give them 30 seconds on my stopwatch. They have a, a, a partner. If you knew me, you'd know that I'm from Boston. If you knew me, you'd know that I have three dogs. If you knew me, you'd know that I love barbecue ribs. If you knew me, you'd know that uh, peanut butter chocolate chip ice cream is my favorite food. If you knew me, you'd know that the Grateful Dead is my favorite group. If you knew me, you'd know that I never use sunscreen. If you knew me, you'd know that. And so they get 30 seconds, and then they switch. It gets them talking. It gets them laughing. It gets them engaged. Mm -hmm. And then I go around, tell me something you learned about your partner and that sort of thing. So that's the icebreaker. I don't always do it it's if I'm tight for time, but if I sense that there are a lot of clicks, I do it. Mm -hmm. So then I do the who considers himself or herself an athlete. You don't have to do these things. But where I'm going with this is if you stop and think about kids, there's so many people that identify themselves by being an athlete but don't recognize the transferable skills that they'll bring later on. So I say, okay, they all raise, similar, you know, a lot of kids raise their hand. Okay, cool. You, what do you play? I play basketball. What, what characteristics do you think you need to be an effective basketball? Determination, hard work, commitment, you know, and I just go around the room and I get, um, you know, as a, a number of kids to get them talking early and identifying characteristics and then, Again, ask them, do you think you could take those characteristics and apply them outside of the field, the court, the pool, the rink? Mm -hmm. so it gets them thinking a little bit. Um, you don't have to, but it's, I, I sometimes put in the stat, I didn't in this, of that 75% of Fortune 500 company CEOs um, played high school sports. Um, I think it's an interesting thing. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but there, there was a, a, a research on leadership. Again, 75% of Fortune 500 company CEOs played high school sports, but only 20% of them made the honor roll. What was that percentage? 20? 20% made the honor roll. And 80% and of women who manage 100 people or more played high school sports. Huh. So the question is, why is that so? Uh, you know, I think is I, those are just little nuggets I keep. So then I'm changing the slides again. I just bore the lips. This was just last week, and a, an attempt to sort of play off of um, this self-identification as an athlete. Um, I don't know if I put the notes in it for somewhere else. Do you guys know the story of Austin Hatch? No. Okay, Austin Hatch was a. Uh, he was an, a, a, a great high school basketball player, and I'm actually even checking my notes to make sure I get this exactly right. Um, and what happened was, let me let me find the thing right here. Okay, in, in 2003, he and his dad walked away from a 2003 plane crash that killed his mother, 11-year-old sister, and 5-year-old brother. I did hear about this, yeah. In 2011, Hatch experienced a sickening case of deja vu. His dad was flying the family to its Michigan home, summer home in June of 2011 when the small single-engine plane plummeted nose first into a garage along a residential street north of Charlevoix Municipal Airport, killing his father and stepmother and critically injuring himself. Huh. So the point was, he was this incredible 
you know, high school basketball player, all his entire family basically was killed and rehabilitated, made it back on to the Michigan team. Um, so got back to Division One basketball. And last week, even though he had eligibility, he realized he just couldn't play anymore. So they made him an assistant coach. Hmm. And it was, this was in Yahoo Sports, but I love this quote. He said, basketball has always been a huge part of my life. However, it's what I play, not who I am. Mm -hmm. and, uh, anyway, those are the types of little things I always throw in there to, to pay off what we're talking about and keep it mm -hmm. current. So, Absolutely. I, think it's, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, but, that's good. Okay. So, you know what I actually realized? I took, um, I, I actually accidentally deleted in here. Mm -hmm. um, was who the teammate you most admire and why? Right. I'll have to reset it. I, that actually, frankly, disappeared. Okay. That will come after this Austin Hatch. Okay. And that's is that's in the standard one, right? Yes. All right. So I'll send that as an email. But at this point, while they're already standing, I have them. You know, stay with their partners and discuss who is the team. I have them meet new people. I have them engaged in, in, in a discussion now. Have them share who the, you know, who did you pick and why. The, again, rhetorical question, you know, when I come back next year, who here would want to be the answer? Mm -hmm. So, because why do I ask that? Because the reality is you identify things you admire, are they the type of things you give back? Mm -hmm. So, again, I don't want to be, I'm sure you can figure this part out. So then I did put in the polling question, when you hear the word competitor, what characteristics come to mind? The point of why I set this workshop up is when you're new, you don't have to remember all this stuff. It's basically right here. Mm -hmm. The reason I put in the word competitor versus compete, or I put it in quotes, is because so often new trainers use the word, what does it mean to compete, which is not the question. It's what does it mean to be a competitor. Right. I said, okay, I'd asked you for an, I asked you for a word definition 10 minutes ago. Now I want you to give me a visual definition. Here are your choices. If, oh. when you hear the word competitor and you look at picture number one, if that is closely aligned to your definition, don't do anything yet. Corner two and say, ah, when I think of what it looks like to be a competitor, it looks like number two, you're going to go to this corner. If it's number four, you're going to go to that corner. And if it's three, you go to this corner. Is it clear what I'm saying? Go. Yep. The point, I, I can't emphasize enough, again, from experience of watching some people who are new, you want it as generic as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. If you say the, the women battling for the rebound, the man comforting the injured player, the guy who supporting his teammate who messed up and the girl celebrating a goal is leading. Mm -hmm. you know? Just keep it generic. If somebody, this is me anyway, and Cal, please jump in anytime. I never yep. give the option to stand in the middle, but if somebody comes up to me privately and asks, I let them. Mm -hmm. Because if you say you could stand in the middle, everyone's going to stand in the middle. Yeah. I tell them they have to pick one. Yeah. I do. And you always do get somebody that's like, uh, I don't know. But I just say, you know what, just pick one. Even if you agree with a couple of them, pick the one you feel most defines what it means to be a competitor. Again, each, whatever way you want. The fun thing there is I'll just get on that person in the middle. Why? And, that, and somebody will get the answer. Either yeah. way. Another polling question that I like a lot about this is, you know, what's the one difference between picture number one and every other picture? You know, it's it's the only in-game action. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, that picture gets picked the most by far. Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because most people tend to resonate in, and view competitors more about what they do on the field. Mm -hmm. I then do word association. I say, okay, fine. Because somebody will have said picture number one, they will have used the word battling. They will have used the word compete. Mm -hmm. They will have use something along those lines. I said, all right, so when I asked you number one, you said intensity, you said battling. What word would you associate with picture number two? And somebody's going to say sportsmanship. Yep. I say, okay, interesting. So your definition of the word competitor encompasses sportsmanship. What do you see for four? I usually, because three is barely ever picked, so I tend to go to four first. You know, in some fashion, they're going to say support. And on picture three, they're going to say celebration. Mm-hmm. And in some fashion, say there's never right or wrong. It's simply how wide or narrow it is on the definition because you said that you said celebration of an accomplished goal. Fine. So now then they sit down. So now they've already been up. They've been up for about 10 minutes. They've mm -hmm. moved and partnered. They've done a breakout session. They've gone 
corners, and now they can sit down. Sure. So then it, now, okay, triple impact competitor, we talk about the three elements. The first one is making yourself better. Yep. I'll be curious, Kel, what your opinion is on this. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of giving out the books. Some, one, because I don't want to ever base my workshops on things that half the time they don't have. But more my experience is that they, um, they leave them. <laughs> Either they leave them in the room or they look at them in parts when I don't want them looking at them. Hmm. I give them out right off the bat because I have the, when I do the teammate you most admire, I have them write it down. The initials of the person, just to get them, you know, looking in the book. And then what I do is when I ha when you said, you know, come back next year, I say, you know, when somebody comes back in two or three years, what are they going to remember about you as an athlete? And I have them actually write it down in the book. So I do. The way that I solve it is at the very end when they take out the uh, the evaluation. I have them hold the book up in the air before they walk out the door. <laughs> so everybody's got the book in their hand before they walk out the door. And I tell them that holding the book in your hand is your ticket to leave. So that's how I've I've helped it from not being uh, not being left. That's great, you know. And this is exactly again of sort of the magic in the room of your, you know, experiences. I would say somewhat from working in a classroom and just lean into whatever. So mm -hmm. one way or another, whether they have the book or don't have the book, I then, depending on time, you know, I have taken that clip art of page seven. Mm -hmm. If they have the books, turn to page seven. If they don't have the books. What I do is I read them off, yeah, and I say, "Look, raise your hand. You know, four or higher, raise your hand." And I go through all of them. If they do them together, you know, if they have the book, they can fill them out on their own. They can then share with the partner in some fashion. Though I at least do it, whether I read it off or they do it. Now they've at least done an exercise. Okay. So I like to. I do like to have them do it in the book. I've never done it just by raising their hand, but I actually do it, and then I have them not share it. Um, I just think they're more honest, and I tell them this is just between you and yourself, and you're just going to do it. Okay. And I have them go through Again. it and circle the ones that have a, a three or above, and I have them put a star next to them. So I use this almost as a challenge. Like if you have, um, if you've scored, you know, a four or five on any of these, that's an area you're very strong in. That's an area where it's your job to help your team in those areas. Then the areas that I put a star next to are the ones that are like a one or a two. Those are the areas that you might need some help on. So I kind of work it into how to help each other, how to help your teammates and make them better. That you have some areas that you're very strong in and you have some areas that your team needs your help to, you know, that's a leadership role for you to bring that out. So that's why I have them write it down. But either way, works well too. And this is exactly where I want and why when, when we said, well, should they do the same thing? I don't think you need to do the same thing. I just yeah. think you need to be great because I don't do it the way Kelly does it, but her explanation makes it great. I have success with mine and what I have them do. One is they sort of can see where they're good and where they're not. And then mm -hmm. I said, look, because I do this with our high school team, is I have every player fill it out and I fill it out next to them. Mm -hmm. And then I compare how I see them versus how they see themselves. Mm, that's good. I like that. And so, so that's some little takeaway. So yep. you can do that. A okay. little nugget here is that uh, I was reading The Social Animal by James Brooks, and there was a study that found that 90% of men rate themselves as above average, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and only 20, and only 35% of women do. So guys, t they, the girls <laughs> in particular I always laugh at that because uh, guys do over over inflate and uh, girls tend to under. So anyhow, I can't imagine that based on my experience. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you've never been a guy. No, yeah. I have not. <laughs> no, I've never been a teenage guy. <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> just ask me. Anyhow, um, so then I do like the coach. My coach sucks, I think, is really a fun video. And they all laugh. Uh, were you guys able to get that to play? Yes, yes. Casey, were you? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Again, you don't have to do it, but it, it, it definitely gets away from Stanford University for a little while. Um, <laughs> So again, we get into the mastery stuff in a sense. The only yep. polling questions, a couple things, or pushing points that I hit on it. I do think effort is equal to commitment. I, I make that point. I even, at times, depending on the environment, as we get to mistakes, you're okay, or even results. Well, first thing I do is I tell that little story about, um, again, this is a me story. When I taught high school English, first day English class, I asked the kids, what do you want to get out of English? Half the kids said, I want to get an A. And the other kid, half the kids said, I want to become a great writer. Hmm. 
in the in the big picture, what is will give you the greatest chance to get it? A, you know, over the long run in English is becoming a great writer. So again, they immediately make a connection in their everyday life to um, mastery. Mm -hmm. So I I do tend to talk about school a lot there. Um, mistakes are okay versus not okay. The two things that, or the one thing at least that I would throw out there is when I ask them, you know, what is the number one impediment to peak performance? Or when you play, what do you fear most? They will tell you mistakes. Mm -hmm. Someone will say losing. And frankly, somebody, if it, depending on the sport, will say getting hurt. But in some fashion, peak performance is fear of failure um, is, Eric? I think, a big thing. Eric? Yes. So what I've found is that... <clears throat> Players actually like the idea of not making a mistake because it takes the pressure off. But then they'll say, but what about my coach who always yells at us for making mistakes? Yeah. How do you enlighten them in that situation? In this, I said, and that's why we're doing workshops with the coaches as well. Bingo, that's not, that's not what you say. And if not, bring us in to talk to your coaches. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Here's the other thing. Just and I'll just throw this out there because you don't have to use this either. Another thing that I've actually, depending on the school I go to, is I talk about honors classes. Do you have? Are your honors classes weighted? And mm -hmm. I, I, again, I know some of these rhetorical questions. You know it, but yeah. why do they weight an honors class? Is to get people to take risk and not worry about blowing their GPA. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Good point. If yeah. they're going to wait honors, they will take algebra two and get a, a keep your four zero. Or are you going to try and really master math and take a risk and do something harder? The reality is the waiting of an honors class is simply an inducement to take risk. Mm -hmm. Now that I don't tell that story every single time. Yeah. I make that point every time. But in the right setting, it really does register. Mm -hmm. The next thing is anyone here ever been in the zone when players are feeling of control. Again, I, I think I've told you this. I, I can't stand fill in the blanks. I, I, I never have people guess. I just tell them. So I don't even remember this PowerPoint, frankly, in the, in the mode I have, whether it pops on. Control. Anybody here ever been in the zone? Yeah, I was. When you're playing in the zone, you worry about making mistakes? No. So in some fashion, as it pertains to peak performance, when you eliminate, you know, mentally eliminate fear of failure, you're going to play the best you can play. So anxiety goes down, self-confidence goes up. I've said all this stuff before, but nobody cares about Robert Rozier. To lead with Robert Rozier fi finds, to me, is the tail wagging the dog. They will tell you themselves. And Robert can support it to lead. Um, the next thing, slide 11, this, this response to mistakes, this is, as you can see, is not in the PCA book. You don't have to use it. But I have found the notion of temporary, localized, and changeable pretty effective. I'm not a big mistake ritual person. It doesn't mean it doesn't have huge value. I just don't spend that much time talking about it. Cal, maybe you do. Um, I do, but I do talk about there's different mistake rituals. Mistake rituals are not always a physical flush or a brush off. I teach them that as a mistake ritual. But, you know, sometimes mistake rituals can just be in your mind, what you say to yourself, something that will get you out of mistakes, something that will eliminate the fear of mistakes in your own mind. In yeah. fate, because you might be on one of those teams where you have a coach that is not one to forgive mistakes easily. So you need to come up with some way inside of yourself to forgive yourself from the mistake and move on, even if your coach does not. So that's when I talk about mistake rituals. It doesn't always have to be a physical flush or brush off or snap on a rubber band, but there needs to be something. Yeah. So explain this to me. What do you mean by temporary, localized, and changeable? Okay. It, it, again, I use a personal story here. When one thing in their game goes wrong, everything falls apart, and they always do. So I tell a story about uh, that Doc Rivers told me when I was interviewing him for the online workshops, and he was telling me about the story of Paul Pierce. And one game, Paul Pierce went 0 for 10 in the first half, and as they're walking to the locker room, he turns to Doc and says, I got him right where I want him. And Doc <laughs> said, right. He goes, there's no way I'm missing 10 in a row again. And he went out and scored 38 points in the second half. It was the most points he'd ever scored in a half in his career. The point was, Paul Pierce's response to mistakes was one is temporary. There's no way I'm missing 10 in a row again. 
The next thing is it's localized. Does anybody here play basketball? Somebody always does. When your shot isn't dropping, can you think of two other things you could do on the court to help your team win? I could box out. I could dive on the floor. I could rebound. I could, you know, something. Play defense, yada, yada, yada. When it's localized, it's only one part of your game. And the final thing is if you miss 10 turnaround jump shots in the game, what's the first thing you need to do in practice tomorrow? Take 100 turnaround jump shots. In some fashion, the empowerment you know, be the solution, not the problem. That, and you don't have to keep it in there. I'm just, that's why it was in there. Mm -hmm. No, it's good. It's really good. Okay. Then it, then I did go back to the PCA stuff, which leads us to the uh, effort goals. And um, I'll be honest with you, this one's really hard. I, the, the goal setting either can take like the rest of the workshop or I go through it somewhat quickly, depending too on how big the group is. In some fashion, getting to explain about effort goals and who sets goals, what are they, uh, I explain about, you know, how do you view setbacks, and I do talk about grit. Um, the picture here, the reason, and again, I, I would urge you to find your own voice in this and whatever you want. The reason this picture is in here, and, uh, and Kelly, you met Julia. Oh, uh, is that who that is? Yeah. The deal with this was Julia Beasley is a rower, obviously. She was, she was a, in a pair with, uh, you know, obviously another woman. The the, uh, it, the rule to be on the U.S. Women's Olympic team is you had to be five foot nine, mm -hmm. and her partner said, "I can't believe we're not going to be in the Olympics. You're too so, short. That, it's, uh, it's an open tryout." So they got in their car and drove. Hold on. Say say again what you were saying. You stopped it where her her partner was. What your voice dropped out. I got you. Said, I can't believe we're not going to get to be on the Olympic team because you're too short. Oh. He's five eight and three quarters. Okay. And her response was, "To heck with that! It's an open tryout." They got in a car and drove from Boston to Tennessee and made the team. Hmm. So, and then later she went on to win the head of the Charles, which is the world's biggest regatta. So, I'd say to them, "What would you do if your dream was to play in the? If your dream was to be in the Olympics, and someone, you know, I had, hold up my fingers, and someone says you can't be on the team because you're this too, you know, this much too short. What are you going to do?" Um, and so I just I tell them that and see what they would say. Again, you don't have to do that. In some fashion, though, the ability to stay focused on a long-term goal in the face of short-term disappointment is going to be huge. How are you going to handle it if you get a bad grade? How do you handle it if you lose your starting? However, you want to handle it in some fashion, I do talk about that. Is that again, still the rule? That's, that's like where you can lose. <laughs> it was for these. Uh, they had brought in some East German coaches, and that was that was their team. That was their team rule. No, it's not a real rule. It was. Oh. It was. I was like, rule. No, it's like an arbitrary thing that the coach wasn't going to take them. Yeah. Wow. The old, you know, the clock doesn't lie. You know, they went down and drove in the car, and they kicked butt, and they made the team. Yeah. So awesome. Anyway. Cool. So it's great. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, the next one you said about grit. So anyway, that is the next slide. That is the definition of grit. Her goal was in the. Her goal was to be in the Olympics. Her long-term goal. She had initial short-term disappointment in being told she couldn't over technicality, and then overcame it. Mm -hmm. So. Again, I just come coming back. You know, again, you guys know all this, but getting them to think about what are they going to do if they lose their starting position? What are they? How do they handle getting a B instead of an A? The handle. I wouldn't say getting dumped by somebody, but you know, whatever it is, staying focused on the long-term goal because, again, that bigger picture stuff of I, I ask in different workshops about instant gratification. I mean, it's such a society of instant gratification in a mm -hmm. couple. Of more competitive world than ever before, so I, I kind of hit this thing fairly hard. Sure. This yeah. one, so then move on to the goals, outcome versus performance. Yep. I asked him, I had said earlier who sets goals, what are they? I kind of wait till somebody basically gives, you know, I do explain outcome goals versus performance goals. I know you guys already know this, so I'm not going to waste time on that unless you really want me to. Well, how do you how do you frame that in terms of outcome goals, performance goals, and then effort goals? Do you not use the term effort goals then? No, I don't. Okay. Because, no, but you could, but I don't. Because to me, they don't, kids just, they cannot, they don't have a, a solid grasp of 
I think you could. You could call them that. But basically, they it, it's always like be our rival or do a type. You know, I keep coming back to it's a peak performance workshop, and mm -hmm. if you perform at your highest level, you're going to win. So I don't. Okay. Um, so you use performance me. goals. You, you explain performance goals not – I mean, you use that term instead of effort goals is what I'm saying. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. I didn't even – I guess it's been a while since I looked at the book, so anyhow, uh, yes, that's how I do that. So Randy and I talked about this yesterday. Um, the terms, it, I took this chart from my nephew, who's an Olympic ski coach and trains ultra marathoners and triathletes. Okay. You don't have to use it. And Randy and I talked yesterday about is is well, the, no, I like it. I, I like it. It was just a little bit of terminology in terms of my understanding, but it's, I, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, but all I'm saying is you can. I don't care. You know, you can change the phrasing to and, and Keller or anybody. You can change if you if you think effort goals is easier to explain than performance. Again, I'm not. This is. I don't treat any of this as gospel. I just like putting at the top, becoming all league or winning the state championship or coming an all American in some fashion and plugging it into the top, and then I give them. I, I have them do this as a project. If there's time, and this is where it is helpful in the book, they just draw a little triangle, mm -hmm. and I walk. I'll take one person because usually there's somebody that gives you an outcome goal of some sort of become all league, and I say, okay, let's put all league at the top. Okay, how about if I gave you underneath to become better on the field, become better off the field, and they're like, okay, and it's, can you give me two things that you could do, um, two things you could do on a daily basis that would make you better on the field, and then you know it could be improve my ball handling skills and it's like okay can you give me two things underneath it that you could do to improve your ball handling skills the ladder drills and cones or air dribbling and this and you know I, I walk it through it with one person sometimes I'll send them off as a team and they do it as a team it really depends on the time mm -hmm. but those are why those things are in there because in the back of my mind I, I just think it's a great visual for visual learners to see the fact that it's you know it's a nice visual way to make it clear that the performance goals or effort goals are the ones that can, because all of them can give you outcome goals and almost none of them can give you performance or effort goals. Right. So the top is always the outcome goal, but everything underneath it are all the performance goals and the effort goals. Exactly. So I, like I said, to me it's the easiest one to explain is mm -hmm. better on the field, better off the field. So if you're better off the field to the right is get more sleep. What are two things that could get more sleep? And I would say, I know it would kill you, but turn your phone off. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and don't fall behind in school. Um, mm -hmm. Eat better. What would be two things that would eat better? You know, vegetables or salad, and you know, no, no Red Bull or something. You know, what I mean? but, <laughs> no but, monster. Yeah, getting them to do it will help. And I, I just like this quote: "The Herm Edwards, a goal without a plan is a wish." Again, yeah, that's you can a great take. One. It, but I think it's pretty fun. Wait, so, that? And then again, this this picture when I dump this over to from keynote, it, it again skewed the messed the picture up. Uh, obviously making your teammates better not beat. Um, don't have to do this one either. I do have them, def This I took from Joe Ehrman, Inside Out Coaching, what's your definition of a team? You don't have to do it, but getting them to explain it in some fashion, they're going to common causes for the team. Because Oh, that's, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you. Yeah. At this point, I make them get up and switch seats and sit by team. Okay. So initially, like I said, I had them all mixed up when they find people they didn't know. Then I have them get up and sit by team. Uh, it, you use, if it's a big group, you use the captains to organize your team. Mm -hmm. So now they're sitting by teams. So I get the, each team to, what's your definition of a team, write it down. What's the okay. cause of the team and write it down. So now, again, they're sort of doing stuff. We've used the performance goals already from the, from the goal-setting pyramid. Um, I then use the University of Arizona as an example. You don't have to do that, but in some fashion, I don't always get them to write it out, if, depending on time, but if you have the time, they could write out something similar to the University of Arizona. Oh, that's yep. what this is here. Yes. I just wanted to go back to this one real quick. This, um, when you have them write it down, like I understand this definition, and then you have them write it down, common purpose. Um, so you have them actually, as a group, come up with a common purpose for their team? You, you sort of got underwater for a second. Oh, what 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 do you mean by common purpose for your team? What kind of answers are you looking for there? 
to win the state championship to be the best. Okay. That's the goal. Yeah, that's that's the goal. Okay. So then performance goals and objectives is that that's based on team as well. Yes. Now we're okay. all in the team mode. Okay. What are the, you know, compete and you know show up 100% attendance. It's going to be exactly what it looks like in the next slide. Okay. And then the mutually accountable work ethic. Do you have? I mean, do you go through each one of these and have them write down something for each one? No, I just okay. to say you got to establish a common purpose. You have to set goals and objectives based around performance. Okay. And usually, and it also, as you well know, changes so much. It, if it's a small group and a bunch of captains, or if it's freaking three hundred people, the mutually yeah. accountable work ethic is hard to, but in some fashion. Yeah. This is what it looks like with the University of Arizona. There's an example. So then it leads us into the most. Oh, okay. Because now we're all talking about how you can make your teammates better. Again, this is like falling off a log. Here's the picture to the tank draining and tank filling. I would strongly urge if you had captains, at some point we got to get you the Brad Stevens. Um, do you raise the energy level in the room and be yes, a giver? Yes, that's fantastic. That should be in this. Yeah, it, I just uh, I was worried about it being too heavy as it was. Yeah. The thing that I would call your attention to yeah. is I've added for what drains tanks of your teammates is clicks and hazing. Oh, okay. And the team building activities I'm filling because it's going to lead me into the hazing and bullying. Then it doesn't yeah. come out of the out of nowhere. Yep. Okay. I like that. All right. So then I have the hazing and bullying. And how do you define hazing and bullying? Okay. It's probably, again, I use this old template, I apologize. You probably should have bullying first and hazing second. It should, it should read, how do you define bullying and hazing? I'm okay. so glad you have that stuff in there, Eric. Thanks. It's good. So, again, I, I'm big in this, big, write it down. They're working as a chasing. Again, I, I know, Randy, this is like completely your expertise, your field of expertise, not mine. I'll just say that the general types of things that I'll get that, that where I'm angling at least mm -hmm. is in some fashion they will tell you that bullying is infinite and is done yep. to exclude. Yep. And hazing is finite yep. with this guided <laughs> idea of to include. Yeah. It's, and Randy, you say that really well when you say, I mean, is that where you would put in like your balance of, imbalance of power? That and, imbalance of power, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And the, but you don't use finite and infinite. What do you use? Because you use a well, different terminology. Uh, bullying, I say bullying never ends. Bullying never ends, right. Yeah. yeah. In yeah. some fashion, once a target, always a target. You know, the thing that really gets interesting is how do you differentiate between traditions and hazing? Yeah. Right. And that's why I talk about the situation with Miami uh, because it started off as hazing, but because it never ended, it turned into bullying. Mm -hmm. That's a great. That's interesting. Yeah. When does hazing turn into bullying? Yeah. Okay. I think important, but I would urge you to stay on. To me, for the impact of, of this workshop is the tradition versus hazing. Yeah, no, yeah. correct. A rite of a rite of passage. It's often like this rite of this rite of passage they talk about. Yeah. You know, if I went through it, everybody else has to go through it. It's something I did. Right. Uh, I became a, a member of this team. Therefore, I have to transfer that same experience onto other players to make them part of that that ritual. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. They will tell you eventually. One kid, the kids say best is like, a, you know, when it goes from either, you know, the, in some fashion is the one, you know, if everyone's in it, it's a tradition. If it's positive, it's a tradition. One kid said, if I could, I, if I could tell my mom about it, it's a tradition. If it's hazing. <laughs> well, if you, I, I go even one step further. Your grandmother, your grand, if, you, if your grandmother can handle it. Yeah. In some fashion, and and one kid said, when it goes from doing something I want to against my will. Mm-hmm. You know, again, by, I, it's always good in your back pocket to have stuff. Yeah. And having worked particularly with the Southeast Conference in football, you know, Clemson running down the hill and rubbing the rock is the tradition. Mm -hmm. Just everyone is denigrating or embarrassing or harm or humiliation or something. But I don't spend so much time on it because I want them to be thinking. Then I give them the which, you know, which are hazing and give yeah. them. Good. Again, working in groups. You guys mm -hmm. fill this out. Pick the ones you want. I go around every single table. What did you guys get? What did you guys get? What did you guys get? Yeah. The equipment is fascinating. Almost everyone. Huge. <laughs> Pardon me? 
I said I always find it to be a huge debate. It's weird. Yeah. Everyone thinks, everyone thinks it's hazing, or half of a lot of people think it's hazing, but everybody does it. And it's well, all good. And I keep saying, you know, tradition is not defined by longevity. So yeah. the two things, particularly down in Florida, the haircuts mm -hmm. and the freshmen get everything. Yeah. So I have fiddled around with this. If you look, the 28 is the Julie Foudy culture and hierarchy. You know, I think you could potentially for the per consequences. In some fashion, I do talk about the, the law of unintended consequences. Why are you guys doing this? You yeah. know, again, what are we asking to think about? And again, I know you know all these things, but why are we doing it? We gotta keep the, we don't want the freshmen to get a fat head or you know, they need to know their place and all those stuff. Or they did it to me. Did you like it? No. What's the first thing you thought of fresh, first practice sophomore year? What's the first thing you thought of? It's like, oh, yes. Ooh, I, don't have to, don't I, mm -hmm. I said, so, okay, so let me understand this. You didn't like it. You did something for a whole year, and then your immediate reaction was to take something that you didn't like and force it upon a complete stranger. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I really it that way. Um, but, and I think Julie's Cloudy's soundbite is just awesome about you know, it, it's accidentally creating a hierarchy. You know, do you want a hierarchy? Is that the is that the little video that comes after the, those questions? That's Eric? twenty-eight. Yeah, the deal. Right. That's that's not coming up on mine. So it I didn't come up on mine either. No. Okay. I'll just resend that. Yep. Resend it separately, then we can embed that in. Yeah. Is that one of the ones that's in so, the again? I, I think she's there, uh, or is that on your own? What's that? I'm is sorry. The Julie Fowdy one is that in the approved workshop videos in the trainer yeah. share, or is that on your own? Yeah, that is. Okay, so we can find it. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's just things should be, should, it's gold. But the other thing in, in, is I tell, again, I'm a, the, Zidane Char, the captain of the Bruins, the word rookie is banned from the team. Hmm. You're going to get like, oh, it's a girl, you know, some stupid thing. But if you're on the Bruins, you're on the Bruins. You're not allowed to call somebody a rookie. You're either on the team or you're not on the team. And... Everyone's on the team. So, again, even at the highest level in one of the toughest sports, they banned the word rookie. Hmm. So, um, again, whether you do the law of unintended consequences slide after the soundbite or before, I think it's really important because you get absolutely great answers from the kids. Hmm. Um, impact of hazing, there's, a, uh, you know, 71%. Again, yes, you could either keep that or leave it. I, I think it's worth it, but anyhow. And you have different percentages around that too, Randy, don't you? Then I now the last thing slide. is I just, how do you want to be, pardon me? I remember when Randy did this because he did this part at my tick workshop and you had other um, statistics around this one as well, didn't you, Randy? Um, about which one? About the, like, does hazing ultimately help your team? I just remember taking notes because it, it says on the slide 71% of students subjected to hazing report yeah, negative well, consequences. A, you, had was, a lot, yeah. you had a few more. Yeah. Add on. I mean, there was a, uh, out of Maine University, they, they did a study, and uh, over 50% of the students in college experienced hazing in high school. And, and of that, 80% um, involved alcohol, 50% uh, involved doing things against people's will. Um, and those that, and there was a part of that talked about those that went through it, uh, hated it. But as, as they continued going through it, it became worse and worse year after year hmm. as part of retribution. Right. I mean, that was the other thing I talked about. And I more talk with the coaches of this uh, magnification or amplification every year. You know, it starts with one eyebrow, and it's like, screw those guys. Yeah. <laughs> them, and then it's two eyebrows, and it's like, oh, and it's the eyebrows and the, half the head, and then it's the next time it's the eyebrows and the whole head, and next thing you know, it's totally out of control. Yeah. So. Then the last thing, and I didn't put in the elements, I just want to keep moving so in case you guys need to go. Uh, it, 31 probably should have honoring the game inserted before I go into the next thing, but by this point I'm just kind of moving along. Uh, I just do rapid fire. How do you want to be remembered? Just pick out a kid. How do you want to be remembered by your teammates? Someone else. How do you want to be remembered by coaches? Someone else. Opponents. And at some point, and someone will say something, and I'll say, honest answer, Who? I don't even care about the grade schoolers and and. I don't talk about the parents. I, I'm basically trying to get to opponents. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, honestly, who, who here even cares? And you get some dialogue there. I was like, I don't really care. So 
then to me the social media is tied to um, honoring the game. So the fact that I probably could have had honoring the game slide in there before, we can give you that if you want it. Okay. But in some fashion, just um, I, I read this tweet. And the story here, this kid won the Mr. New Hampshire Basketball Award given out by the state of New Hampshire. They had lost to Portsmouth earlier in the year, as you can see, and they won the state championship. And after the game, he tweeted this out. And I'll just say, what do you guys think? And how should this be handled? Depending on how you want to handle it. Some days I've just had people say what they think should happen. Some days I've divided the room in half. Again, if I need to get them moving around, I'll just say, like, you guys over here go this way. You guys go over here. Make a compelling argument. Or if it's at tables, you know, sort of alternate tables. Give me compelling arguments why it is a big deal. Give me compelling arguments why it's not a big deal. And then I'd sort of have them share it out. So in some fashion, just so you know, when it says how does it handles, the reality was the kid got stripped of his Mr. New Hampshire basketball title and banned from the two senior showcase tournaments. Mm. So, you know, fair or not fair, I got a little bit of, um, oh, I see. I you know I really had it around teammates. I just had it wedged in, to be honest with you. You could sort of change your flow on how you want to do this. Cause, and Kelly, when you said, is this the one you use? It, it, um, you don't need all these different social media things. Just pick the ones that you like. And then, oh, I know why I did it this way, because it can be honoring the game, okay? If you are done and you run out of time, then you can end it right at 37. Okay. Yeah, because honoring, okay, I got it. If you're not done and, and hopefully you have time, then I do 38, basically explain, you know, a little bit on those things, not a ton, and then I play that video, which the video to me is the perfect example of all of them. It encompasses rules, it encompasses opponents, it even yeah. has the officials, it has the teammates, and it has themselves. Yeah. And then That's I'm done. Great. That's great. That's my story, Corey. The rest of the stuff is uh, is extraneous. Is this, um, the, I'm just going back real quick, the social media ones, because I think they are good. I haven't seen these before. The yep. um, Brandon Chambers tweet. Yeah. <laughs> You've got a picture of uh, Tom Brady. On slide 48. That's funny. Yes. <laughs> Are you yeah. going to keep that one now? <laughs> <laughs> what did he do? I, I have to, I'm sorry, I don't know. What, did he I, don't slide slide. 48? I don't even have slide 48. I only got up to 45. So I must have missed oh, that. Oh, Brady. Yeah, no, I now I have to go get rid of all those things. <laughs> <laughs> Very bitter pill. Decorate is everything, right, Eric? I think this is a pretty interesting conversation. <laughs> right? No, it's, uh, whatever it is, it's, uh, that's the scope. And that just goes to show you the power of sports in our society and how we uh, uh, can learn from these kind of experiences, right or wrong. That's right. And it's always, yeah. it's always the cover up that gets it's you. consumed the news, which is sad. There's yes. so much other stuff going on. It's consumed the news. Yes, it has. There was a discussion yesterday. It says the biggest news story in Boston since well, there's well, other things going on. There's so much more significant, but this is it. This is what gets news. Except that there's a lot of ex there's a lot to it. Of course. <laughs> well, Randy and Casey, do you have? Started questions? with Odysseus and Hubert. Go ahead. Ooh, Odysseus! Now you're going good. There you go. I told you. I told the English class. I was going to say, don't, don't let the English teacher come out in Eric. No, no, have to listen, like I, I taught social studies, so it's his. <laughs> I'm going to have to get out my dictionary to understand you two if you keep going. <laughs> I only taught up to third grade. Third grade vocabulary is as high as it goes. Back to the War of 1812, right? There you go. I, I was in it. Oh, bro. <laughs> I thought I recognized you. So, Casey, any, any, any questions? No, no, I don't. I'm still, I'm, I am going to go back, uh, you know, and just review my notes and digest this a, a little bit further. But uh, no questions at this point. I thought it was excellent. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And again, we're still weeks away. So again, it, this is not how to do it. It's just one way to do it. And then what we can do is tweak however, you know, whatever I can do to help you be the most comfortable you can be, let me know. Obviously, I'll send the Julie Foudy video to everybody. All right. Um, so soup to nuts, how long does this take you, Eric? Hour, hour and 50. I mean, it has to be an hour and 15. Yeah. <laughs> 
So you could get out early. You can end it with certain pieces. Gotcha. Okay. But it's designed to be an hour and 15 minutes. That's what I thought. Okay. And I found, but actually, that's what's a little bit more tricky about the tick workshop. If you're doing a coach's workshop and you end early, you can dismiss. The tick workshops, a lot of time, especially if they're during the school day, you have a time limit and you have to stick exactly to that time. I have found, anyway, yeah. that you know you have to dismiss them at 2 o'clock. I don't care if you're done at 1.30. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have to really be aware of time, I think, more so for tick than you do for the other ones. Even nope. though they want to get out early, a lot of times the administration are like, no, 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 they've got to stay till the end of the day. <laughs> they're not going back to class. You'll never end up early with this. Yeah. Never. With a six-minute video. I, I just see there's so many chances to do some group work, and grouping itself takes time. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You'll never be early. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is you can't be late, and they yeah. don't know what you don't know. And if right. you give them the book, say, look, there's no way we could cover you know, 80 pages in an hour. I urge you to do whatever. That's why I give them some exercises afterwards instead. Mm hmm Gotcha. Look yeah, at Kate. She's ready to ride. She's ready to ride. I mean, ready to ride. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. It got a little sunny out here. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for your time. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Sure. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Of course. We'll see you soon, Casey. Nice to meet you. Okay. Very nice to meet you too. See you soon, Randy. Okay. See you, Eric. Guys, right. if you bye want bye. to run anything bye. by us beforehand, please feel free to do that. Thanks, Kelly. Yep. Thanks, Absolutely. Kelly. Thank you very much. Take care. All right, bye-bye.